My name is Clancy Emerson. I'm an alcoholic. I was just trying to be humble. I never dreamed she'd do it that way. My little something works out. Our speaker tonight is a wonderful guy. I really am glad to be here tonight. I'm glad to be here for the 50th anniversary of AA in Delaware. I'm glad you're here be kind of a 50th anniversary for me in a way. I want to especially thank uh, Larry, and uh, who's been corresponding with me from time to time. I've known him for some time and put in some clout to get me invited here, I hope. And he came to the railroad station and picked me up and brought Tom and Bob. And we had a very wonderful trip down yesterday. It's a very odd thing. When, when people are activists in AA, they, they wind up always feeling the same. We were talking about it on the way down. We had a lot of laughter, and we all hated the same things and loved the same things, and we attacked victims and counselors and <laughs> cherished steps and traditions. Larry didn't get much of a chance to talk. We felt a little sorry about that, so when we stopped at the meal, we all stopped talking when the girl said, who'll take the check? <laughs> Larry got a chance to talk at last. I will. <laughs> <laughs> and I've enjoyed being here. I enjoyed the meetings last night. I've enjoyed the feelings here. I've enjoyed the, enjoyed the meeting this morning, my old friend Joni. It's a great pleasure to be here. And it's a, uh, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling to be safe and sane and sober. Because I didn't used to be a lot of friends here I've met, that I've met in other places. Ocean City, where I had my finger cut off. That was really terrible a long time after that because I had to keep it up like this. They had a bandage around it, and you have, you have to keep it up and drive it on the freeways in L.A. Go. <laughs> Some friends of mine from New York and Baltimore and other places here, Eddie and his troops. But I, uh, I want to... Uh, I wasn't going to talk about this, I just want to talk about it for a couple of minutes because just take a little bit, it won't take very long, I don't guess. But it's something I, I re think about once in a while and I thought about it when I saw your 50th anniversary. This is also the 50th anniversary of a rather important date in AA history, which I'll tell you what it is. For those of you who are kind of new and may not be familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous and his background, you just take it for granted, as I did when I came to AA. And it's a hard thing to remember sometimes when you stop and think alcoholism in one name or another called it different names and called it insanity once. There are written records of alcoholism that go back over 4,000 years. Over 4,000 years. Now, there's people like you and me who get an unnatural reaction to alcohol, who don't know it's an unnatural reaction to alcohol, who live and seem to be strange and alien and foreign to the people about them. One time they put them to death. They thought they were possessed by evil spirits and they exorcised them and tortured them and did all sorts of things put them in hospitals, send them away. And in all these 4,000 years, and there's been people trying to help people like you and me, because you, you were exposed to them long before you came to AA. There's always people who say, I know how you feel, but unfortunately we always know they don't know how I feel. But in all these 4,000 years, there's only been two brief little periods where there's ever been a place for people like you and me to go to. And you and I are extremely fortunate to be in one of these windows because we're sitting in it tonight. But the other one you may not be familiar with if you're kind of new. And I'll just give you a little brief tell a story about it. In 1840, in the first half of the last century, there was the biggest period of drinking per capita in the history of the country. Nobody knows why. And in 1840, six old drunks sitting in a bar in Baltimore, one guy had just been released from jail again. They had all taken the pledge. It didn't work. They'd gone to church. They didn't work. And one guy said something effective. You know, it's too bad you guys aren't doctors because you understand how I feel. You're the only ones who do. And the other guy says, yeah, and you understand how I feel. And they say, how about this? What if we each try to understand how the other one feels and we all try to help each other stay sober? And it sounded ridiculous. Drunkards helping drunkards? What kind of help is that? But they held together. And they got a few little more people in. They got a few little more people in. And pretty soon they had a little chapter in Philadelphia. And pretty soon they had a little chapter in Washington. And pretty soon they had little groups of people scattered around. And by this time they had, uh, it was really, people were ridiculing them, you know, these drunkards helping drunkards, really ridiculous. But they were somewhat successful. At the end of a few months they, uh, they tried to find a name for themselves. They, there had never been a group of drunkards trying to help drunkards, so they were the first ones ever. That reminded them of the first president. 
So they called themselves the Washingtonians after George Washington. At the end of the year, they had several thousand sober drunkards. Couldn't believe it. At the end of two years, there were most of the northern states and then some of the southern states. In fact, they sent, they took uh, February 22nd, Washington's birthday is their official anniversary. They sent out a note to all their chapters that they knew about and said, help people understand that drunkards can help drunkards. Have someone in your community who is kind of successful and who is not a drunkard to come and speak at the meeting on our anniversary. Then you can go back and tell people what we're like. So all over the country, people did that. An interesting thing, the little meeting in Springfield, Illinois, invited a young lawyer named Abraham Lincoln, who came out and talked to the Washingtonians. In fact, I have a copy of his speech on my wall in my office, because it's very perceptive. He didn't know anything about drunkards, but he said, it's as though you people somehow have a thirst that I don't have. I can't take credit for not having it, but you have a terrible thirst that's changed your lives, and somehow you're able to do something about that, and I admire you for it. I'll certainly tell people about what you're doing. By 1845, five years later, the estimated membership of the Washingtonians in the United States was about 500,000 sober drunkards. To put that in perspective, Alcoholics Anonymous, after five years, had a little over 1,000 members, and that's with radio and, and uh, letters and communication and all sorts of things, telephones. And then in 1845, and shortly thereafter, the Washingtonians did something that seems intellectually correct. And people want to do it in AA today and have been wanting to do it off and on ever since AA found it. They got the feeling, God, if we can help drunkards, let's try to help people with other problems. Let's help people of other who are e equally tormented. Let's show our message to other people. So they began to take in narcotics, help narcotics addicts who were not drunkards. Uh, not narcotics the way we understand it today, heroin and cocaine, but laudanum and opium, things that were quite common in those days. They wanted to help people who had other problems. They helped people who were active in the anti-slavery movement to help them free the slaves. They had some people in there who had a movement to fight Mexico, that was before the Mexican War, to get, to get Texas for the Americans, and political activists. They had a whole bunch of people who got involved in the temperance movement, which was a big thing, which to prohib prohibit the sale of alcohol. They really helped a lot. They got involved and people were doing so well and they helped so many people. And oddly enough, by 1848, the Washingtonians were extinct. And with very few exceptions, all 500,000 sober drunkards died drunk. In fact, I have a book home written in 1862 by one of the members, it's quite a touching thing. He doesn't know what happened. He said, we were doing so well and we were helping so many people, all of a sudden people weren't coming around anymore and the people didn't, didn't seem to be interested and couldn't imagine what had happened. But they had pulled apart, they had political movements, they had all sorts of things. And I'll tell you how extinct they became. They became totally extinct. Now we'll jump ahead a hundred years. In the early 1940s, Alcoholics Anonymous was doing well. They had the article in the Saturday Evening Post that several thousand members around the country, there are groups, different parts of the country, but they're starting to have extreme difficulties. A lot of problems. AA was coming apart. Just for, for example, Bill Wilson's right-hand man, a man named Hank P., in whose office he wrote the big book, to whose secretary he dictated the big book, got mad at Bill for a problem they thought he had and he got drunk. And he spent the next couple of years visiting AA groups all over the East saying, don't trust Bill Wilson, he's a liar and a sneak and a cheat. Now if you're kind of new in AA and here's a guy saying the founder is trying to cheat you, it undermines you a little bit. A lot of them didn't sail around. The people in Chicago, for example, would have nothing to do with the AA movement in New York. They would only correspond to Akron. People in Los Angeles had wanted nothing to do with Akron. They wanted to correspond to New York. People all over, all sorts of things. Incidentally, tonight, if you look in the archives back there, at the beginning of this uh, fellowship, it said, Mrs. Marty Mann comes to, our, a newspaper writer, Mrs. Marty Mann comes to Delaware to talk on Alcoholics Anonymous. And people were looking for prestige and power and was pulling apart. One of the funny things, is had a good reason for it, but it sounds funny, a guy in Florida 
They had to write him a letter because they found he was selling memberships in AA. <laughs> and, uh, and he had a, I listened to the explanation he had. It sounds wonderful. He said, I'm not trying to make money. He said, it just seems that people don't want to listen to things that they get for nothing. If they got to pay for it, they'll listen to it. And I take the money and send it to New York. I don't keep it. I'm trying to help them learn. And, but it's just coming apart. And in about the same time of year, the founding of AA in, in uh, Delaware, a man in North Carolina wrote a letter to New York to Bill Wilson and said, Bill, we're getting like the Washingtonians. We're going to be extinct. And to tell you how extinct the Washingtonians were, Bill Wilson had never heard of them, nor had anybody else. I don't know how the guy in New Orleans, North Carolina had ever heard of him. He must have had some relative in it. So Bill Wilson did some reading and read up on it and found out about it and realized it is. We are like the Washingtonians. We're pulling apart. People are vicious and anti each other and they're fighting and problems. And so for the next year or two, he sat down and he talked to a lot of people and he thought, how can I hold these people together? Because it's the only, only the second time in history any drunken people can be sober. And uh, what he did, his response was, in the mid-1940s, he sat down and wrote the 12 Traditions. And the 12 Traditions, in case you don't know it, were based as much on the Washingtonian failure as on the AA success. And much of the things that were brought up were based on what people did in both organizations. And he introduced them in the grapevine, little by little, in the long form, not the short form. If any of you have not read the long form, in the back of the book, right across the short from the traditions, is the long form, the way they were originally written. And they make a little more sense because they're a little more complete. We make the long, the short form now, sometimes it's read meetings, sometimes it isn't, like tonight. Uh, <laughs> we don't judge. But, uh, but uh, you know, sometimes, Unfortunately, in meetings, they read the short form just to see if newcomers can pronounce autonomous. Here, Jimmy, you read it. <laughs> but uh, they introduced these traditions, and I'm happy to say that alcoholics then were like alcoholics now. It kicked up a flood of objections. We don't want rules. We don't want rules. We come here to find love. Tell them the rules. And they wouldn't accept it. So that in, in 1950, early 19, late 1949, early 1950, Dr. Bob and Bill, who always got along together, although their followers didn't, but they did, said, if we could all get, get us all together somewhere, we could explain these things, and they would understand that we're all the same. So uh, they told their followers, find us a place where we can get a big convention. And the people in Akron, with maturity beyond their years, said, well, we'll go to a convention but we're not going to New York. Not with those people. Might steal my luggage, eh? <laughs> and the people, uh, people in New York said, well, we'll, we'll go to a convention, but not with them hay shakers in Akron. We're not going to Akron. So Bill and Dr. Bob got together in a Solomon-like decision. They said, Cleveland. <laughs> All right, okay, we'll go there. So they went to Cleveland. And uh, in 1950, the first international convention was held. For all they knew, the last one, but they held the first one. And I have the tapes home of that convention. Very fascinating. Look at that poor lady. She's got something wrong. She walks like this. Very important. They're towing cars out there. They're towing cars. Delaware. Thank you very much. 527849. Black Mercury Cougar. Black Mercury Cougar. <laughs> well, the trouble with these trouble with these memorized talks, now I'll have to start over. <laughs> My name is Clancy Emerson and I'm an alcoholic. God, six people own the Black Mercury Cougar. They won't pour you up. It's too late, folks. It's already towed. Yeah. Yeah. 
But anyway, this convention, instance, some of you may know, that's the con a very famous thing happened at that convention, Dr. Bob's last talk. Most of us have read it. We've been sober while you've read it. I have tapes of it. You can hear it. He is dying of cancer and has had to be helped to the podium. And he gave that great talk about, uh, let's leave the scientific aspects of alcoholism to the scientists. We are not into science. AA is love and service. And we all know what love is. We all know what service is. And uh, let us never be too busy to stop and give the man behind us a pat on the back because none of us would be here if someone hadn't done it for us. And something else that's always true, let us guard that erring member, the tongue, which causes more pain than most things in the world. And he gave a wonderful talk and they helped him down. He died a few months thereafter. It's an interesting thing, in, kind of aside, in 1970, I was at the International Convention in Miami Beach. It was always the at these conventions for Bill Wilson to tell his story on the Friday night meeting. And I'd been to two of them already. So in 1970, we're all gathered together, 15,000 people in the Miami Beach Auditorium, and they come out, the last man said, sorry, Bill cannot talk tonight. He's very ill. We found out later he was dying of emphysema. But he's too ill to talk. And you heard 15,000 people go, oh. They said, but we have a substitute who's going to talk. And I've often felt sorry for that boob, you know. <laughs> He came out there, we all went, yeah, who the hell are you, you know? It wasn't his fault, but we didn't care. Um, but he gave a talk, and we walked back to the, I was walking back to the hotel with an old timer from Pennsylvania, one of Dr. Bob's students. And I said, well, we'll never hear Bill again, that's too bad. He said, ah, Bill Wilson will talk at this convention. I said, no, he won't. I talked to somebody in the GSO office. He ain't going to talk. He'll talk. I said, he's dying. He said, I don't care, he'll talk. <laughs> And I thought, maybe Saturday night. But Saturday night came and went, and the last big meeting was Sunday. It had to be then. And they introduced somebody else, and he didn't talk. Halfway through his talk, a guy came out and tugged him on the sleeve. So I have some wonderful news. Bill Wilson has just been delivered by ambulance back at the curtain. He's going to come out and say a few words. They pushed him on the wheelchair, tubes in his nose, oxygen going in. He must have sucked in a lot of oxygen, because at first his voice was pretty good. You ought to hear that. You can hear the tape. Hello, I'm so glad to be here, and God will certainly let us operate this as long as he wants us to function. And he didn't go very long before he ran out of air, his emphysema patient, and his voice is like the tape was broken. He said, I don't want to wish you all well. And he sat down, and they wheeled him out, and he died shortly thereafter. You think that's funny, Marlene, that he died? That's really cute. Why don't you just straighten up for a little while? She's going to be 27 years sober tomorrow. That's what uh, <laughs> Christ... But anyway, Bill Wilson died the next morning, or a couple months later. And I was walking back to the hotel that morning with this John McHugh, and I said, how in the world did you know he was going to talk? Nobody knew he was going to talk. And he said a very profound thing that's always true. Said, Remember this, kid. You're dealing with human beings. They may be inspired human beings, but they're human beings. Do you think Bill Wilson would want it said, that Dr. Bob talked while he was dying, and he wouldn't. <laughs> and that's certainly true. But that also, that convention, they, you ought to hear the tapes. They have six men, each took two traditions and got up and tried to explain the 12 traditions, that they're not threatening, they are not harmful. We don't even have any enforcement policy other than the people that break them seem to not stay around, and they get drunk, and they die. But at least it gives us, we have an idea of what we're supposed to do. And so they, they uh, begrudgingly voted them in. And since 1950, they've been apart. And the reason you remember that is that a lot of people think the traditions that just came along with the book. They didn't. They're based on hundreds of thousands of people dying, doing it different. The 12 traditions are more important than the 12 steps. And you've got to remember that because of this. If I don't work the 12 steps, I may get drunk and die. If we don't have the 12 traditions, there's going to be no place for any of us to go. And so we want to take care of it. And don't, uh, don't be concerned in your home groups of people who don't know any better want to break the traditions. You outvote them and you put them down and keep them, because the, otherwise there's no place for people like you and me to go. Because the secret of Alcoholics Anonymous and the secret of the Washingtonians is the same. 
what made these two things different from everything else that have been tried for the treatment of alcoholism. They are the only two times in history where drunkards have tried to help drunkards. And when they get away from that, they disappear. And that's why you've got to be a drunkard to be a participating member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's why we say no non-drunkard can be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's in the book, uh, Problems Other Than Alcohol, the little folder written by Bill Wilson. There's not any debate about it. And yet every generation, and they did, I did once, think, why do we just have to confine it to alcoholics? We could help all kinds of people. But we can't help all kinds of people because the magic of identification is not there. That's why members of AA formed NA. Members of AA, he also had a narcotic problem, formed NA so that NA members of narcotics addicts have a place to go to identify. Members of AA who were overeaters formed OA. Members of AA who were gamblers formed GA. I knew all these people. They all were formed in Los Angeles in the late 1950s, early 1960s. <laughs> I don't mean that I know them because of my weight or my gambling problem, but I knew them because they were members of AA at that time. In fact, the founder of GA, great man named Jim Willis, Sybil's husband, some of you know Sybil, oldest living AA member, but he, he got to be, he founded GA and is known all over the world as the Bill Wilson of the GA movement. People have great love him, but he got so active in GA work, he wasn't active at AA anymore. So they were shocked when he got drunk and died. But that's what happens to alcoholics who don't practice these programs. But he's still revered as the GA founder. But I'll tell you, this is serious business. This is not fun time. This is serious. And you and I have to make it our business, or else we'll have to revive AA someday. But if you're like me, I, cert I have three daughters in AA. I'm glad that AA was still the same when they got here. And I have a granddaughter in New York working for MTV, so she's um, automatically in trouble. <laughs> Not yet, but I, you know, all those weirdos, <laughs> Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> but I sure as hell would feel bad if she went to a meeting to find help for her alcoholic problem someday, and someone, all they could talk about was her inner child or what her parents did to her. Instead, let's talk about the 12 steps. I didn't want to get off on that. I want to talk just a few minutes on about my favorite subject, me. <laughs> but it's so easy to see how Alcoholics Anonymous works, and it's so, it's so good, the room is full of people, sober people. You know, at one time, Dr. Jung told a guy, Roland in, uh, in uh, Vienna, or in Switzerland, in his hospital, that alcohol, there was no known cure for alcoholics. That he, as, this was 1932. And uh, yet there's it's AAs everywhere today, sober people everywhere. Just a year ago, just a year ago, I was touring South Africa. I guess I was the only speaker who'd been down there, touring the cities one after another. And the, and the problems were going on then, the, the killings and the problems and the... But in those meetings, there was peace. The only place that I know, been, you know, there were black meetings, there were colored meetings, which was mixed black and white, and there were white meetings. Now the white people, the black people sometimes go to the colored meetings, the colored people sometimes go to the white meetings, the white people will go and speak at the black meetings, but they won't attend the black meetings, and it's just all a mishmash. But they have a national convention where they all got together. And on Sunday afternoon, I, was, I spoke at their national convention on Sunday afternoon, and I walked out, and here were some protesters. I mean, mean-looking protesters. <laughs> And they had a big sign that says, white men, we will wash our feet in your blood. And I reached, tried to reach within me to find a, an appropriate AA response. <laughs> and all I could think of was, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't much, but it's all I had. <laughs> And what they didn't know is that was one of the few meetings in South Africa's history that blacks and coloreds and whites were all together. And some of the black guys rushed out of the meeting and said, <laughs> told them we were all right. They whipped up their sign and away they went. And that was the end of that. But nowhere else in South Africa was that going on. Four or five years ago, I was talking in Belfast, and you could hear the bombs going off down the street. 
No Catholics and Protestants sat down five years ago anywhere together in Northern Ireland. But in that meeting, the chairman was a Catholic, the first speaker was a Protestant, the guy who read chapter five was a Catholic, and I was a Protestant. And we all lived in peace. And it's that way all over. These little pockets of peace. And it's available, it's free, it's everywhere. And so there's really no reason to think anyone really needs to die of alcoholism anymore, or even go crazy, because there's an answer here. We all know about it. There's only one slight little problem. It is estimated today that a little over 95% of alcoholics in America still die drunk, or as a direct result of drinking. I don't think it's any far-fetched thing to say. Many people in this room are going to die hard alcoholic deaths. Not because they doesn't work. Maybe me, maybe you. Who knows? I remember my sponsor told me that when I was new, and I thought he had another scare tactic, for Christ's sake, we're all going to die drunk. <laughs> but uh, some years later, when he got mad at A and stopped going to meetings, and uh, eventually took pills, and eventually got drunk and died drunk after many years of sobriety, it helped me remember what he said. Because it isn't really so much exactly how you do tonight, but it's called a maintenance of the spiritual condition. And that doesn't mean religious. That means doing the things that alcoholics like you and me must do. And it's quite obvious. I'm in a different position than most of you. I see alcoholics die now regularly. I mean, when I say see them die, I don't mean, oh, that guy is sick. I mean, we have to go over and put a blanket over his face and say, this guy's dead. Get him out of here. And I see alcoholics die. Some of these guys I see dying, and I just want to shake them. You know. And I... You know, it, it makes me frustrated. I get a letter, got a letter from a lady in, uh, in India. said, your tape really helped me. I'm really staying sober. Now, if I was supposed to be the big communicator that helps people in India, why can't I help a guy dying in front of me who I know and care about? And I can't do it because he's, he's gone to the area where he's locked himself into a cocoon. Of, and uh, I just want to shake these people and say, come on! I lay on that same sidewalk once, come on! Then I gotta stop and remember, if it were that simple, why did I slip in AA year after year after year? Worst years of my life came after I came to AA. I started going to jail, I went to hospitals, I went, and I, I went to AA and it uh, had no answer for me. Because of one thing that I thought was unique unto me, and I'm sure everyone in this room shares it, a certain part of me down deep, and if I don't watch it, it would still tell me the same thing. But my case is different. It looks the same, but it's different. And I, just, I think every alcoholic in the world has that feeling. And that's what causes people to die drunk. But yet we all have it, we're not going to die drunk, not everybody. Because if you tend to it, you won't die drunk. But that's a hard thing to discover, that's kind of sophisticated up along the line. I. Uh, I used to examine myself a lot because I knew there was something wrong with me. And when I was a young man, it seemed to me the thing that was wrong with me and for years thereafter. I know there's something different about me, but it's not drinking. It is my feelings. I have these feelings that I don't know why I got them, but there's, for example, I suppose the three major areas I sometimes talk about in my life that I can see in looking back. See, like most of my life I've had the feeling that people act like I'm not quite good enough. They don't say anything, and they don't say you're not good enough, but it's just as though they, they seem to like each other better than they like me. When they get close to me, it's almost as though they see something I don't see, and they don't like me. And so the answer I developed as a young man without being aware of it, keep people at arm's length. Don't ever let anybody get close. Give them a tap dance. Do a little, play a role for them. What's the one you get lonely and you bring people get close and they turn on you and say, keep them apart. Keep them away. Because I, I don't want them to find out I'm not enough. Another big area of emotion in my life was fear. And not fear of things sometimes, but mostly fear that people would find out I'm not who I'm pretending to be. That I'm playing a role, that I'm inadequate, that they won't like me, that I won't be accepted. Another great area of feeling in my life that's always been there is it always seemed to me my emotions were too, were too sensitive, almost as though there was no, no uh, 
covering for them. Like, there must have been, when people were bored, there's got to be some kind of asbestos over their emotions. And I didn't get any. It's just because I feel things, and I get my feelings hurt a lot. And people, I see rejection where nobody can see rejection. I can sense it in a tone of voice. I can, you know, when I'm at the top of my game, I can see it in a passing memo. I just, they're at it again, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> And these and a lot of other feelings bothered me, and I always had bad feelings. So when I was a young man, I, st I went to psychoanalysis because I wanted to be something. And in psychoanalysis, fortunately for me, I found out why these, I had these feelings. You know, there's a, I've always had the feeling, I'm sure many people in this room have this feeling. If I can just find out why I feel this way, I'll be okay. And I'll, let me give you some hope. You can find out, if you'll spend a little time and money, you can find out. Different therapies will give you different answers, but it'll still be the right answer. The only problem is, after you spent the money and you find out what's wrong, what causes this, it doesn't help. <laughs> you wind up feeling crappy and knowing why. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I've lived my life as though I were on the deck of the Titanic. And it hits the iceberg and down it goes. Everybody rows away as fast as they can. And people like me say, I'm not getting off this baby till I find out why this happened. <laughs> and you may find out why. It gives you a great feeling of spiritual superiority. You know. Hey, you people on the boats! Ha, 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 ha! I know why! <laughs> you know, just... Uh, and it, uh... It takes a while to realize knowing why you're going down the toilet is of no value whatsoever. Yeah, you just... But I, I got discovered a lot of things. I discovered that I'd been, that I'd been repressed by the Norwegian Lutheran Church as a boy. I was, well, it's easy for you to laugh. There's no Norwegian Lutherans here, apparently. It isn't like some easy church, like the Brothers. This was a strong church. Our, our dropouts became Catholic priests. <laughs> And I, uh, I always liked the Norwegian, because my grandparents were big in it, my parents were big in it. I was confirmed I could sing little songs in Norwegian. I, they only have two rules, you don't sin and you don't monkey with Catholics, and, <laughs> which seems reasonable if you want to go to heaven. But as I was growing up, I realized I seemed to no need more fun than other Lutherans for some reason. I didn't know why, and I got sinning. And I got monkeying with Catholics. And then I got sinning with Catholics. And then it's all over. But I never had any bad feelings towards the church because it wasn't their fault. And only later in psychoanalysis I discovered that the Norwegian Lutheran Church had repressed me. I was so disappointed in that church. If I knew then what I know now, I would have formed adult children of Norwegian Lutherans. We could have hired a couple codependents and sat around and been pissed off every week. I discovered all sorts of things. And I always was fighting, and they helped me because I also, also had a great ambition. I wanted to be something. When I work with people that have the, now, that have the type of ambition when I was new, or when I was young, I really feel bad because I think it's going to be a long, hard battle. This is tough. It isn't ambition. It's a sick, neurotic drive. Because it isn't ambition. Ambition looking for success. This thing I had, and most people like me have, is I want to get to be something to show them. Not to ever get anywhere, but just to always show them. And there's never enough. There is never enough. But I didn't know that. In all these years, I went to psychoanalysis, and I read books, and I got in prayer things, when I, and all kinds of dumb things. But the one thing that helped me the most is something I never paid much attention to. The greatest help I've ever had is something I never paid much attention to. When I was a boy, 15 years old, <coughs> very early in the Second World War, whether it was patriotism or neurosis, I ran away from home in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and I lied to my age in San Francisco on the day before my 16th birthday, I was in Pearl Harbor. And it was still pretty rough shot over there. And on that ship, some men, had some whiskey. 
I'd never been in the same room with a bottle of whiskey when I was at that age. Seems incredible today. But they, have a drink. And I didn't want to drink, because I promised my mother and grandmother I'd never drink whiskey. But I wanted their approval more than I wanted any promise to my mother and grandmother. So I took a drink, and I threw up, and they laughed at me, and it made me feel so terrible. I've often thought about that, you know. Momentary insanity like that, that's why to this day, neither I nor the people I sponsor, if I know about it, have a handgun. Because I've watched alcoholics in just a moment's insanity do something that they would never do a minute before or a minute after. But just a, I watched guys in AA do it. Boom! Oh my God, what have I done? Just momentary insanity that hits people like me when they laugh at you or publicly humiliate you. So I tried to hold a drink down, and one day I held it. I would throw up, and when nobody was looking, it's sick. And, oh, but I want so much to be except a small, skinny, pimply faced little puke, because I just <laughs> terrible. And one day I held a drink down, and it just tasted terrible, and I couldn't breathe. <gasps> and all of a sudden, I found that I felt significantly better. <laughs> And that day I realized why people drink whiskey. I never had any big breakthrough. I hear people say, when I took that drink, I realized it had opened a new vista for me, a highway down the line. Ah, I never do that at all. It just made me feel better. You know, there's a book out that says, everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. That may be true, but not for me. Uh, yeah. I never learned anything in kindergarten. I used to have to bring home notes because I wouldn't sleep on my rug, for Christ's sake. Yeah. <laughs> I slept on a lot of rugs later, though, to make up for it. <laughs> but I, uh, you learn things in your teens. That's when human beings learn things. You know, I mean, I'm sure women do as I know men do. You, your body starts to change, and you learn about lust, and then you learn about love, and then you learn if you're going to have any luck whatsoever, you've got to disguise lust. That's love. <laughs> and you learn about your family is going to support you. You learn about smoking. I learned about smoking on that ship. Those guys were smoking cigarettes. I didn't know anybody smoked cigarettes. And I smoked them and puked and smoked them and puked until I finally could smoke a cigarette. And I smoked two and a half, three packs a day for the next 45 years. And there are still, we were talking about this in the car yesterday. There were people who say smoking doesn't hurt you. Let me tell you something. I smoked two and a half packs or three packs a day, it's true, for 45 years. In addition to that, exposed to endless secondhand smoke, early days of my so AA, of course, you couldn't even see the podium just to... <laughs> and everywhere I've ever gone has been a lot of secondhand smoke. So I can tell you, I've been exposed to smoking and secondhand smoke, and by God, it's made me bald. <laughs> If I hadn't smoked, you could call me Curly tonight. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't think much about drinking. It's something I learned to do. And I didn't become a terrible drunkard in the Pacific Ocean. I just learned to drink. I really got drunk and thought I was a big grown-up. And I was in the Merchant Marine then. And later in the war, I got to be 17. I was went into the Navy. At the end of the war, I got discharged from a hospital up in Northern California and went back to, took some tests in that co high or hospital. So I got a high school diploma, and I went back to college after the war. And I got married in college to a Catholic girl. But my grandmother should give her a set of the vapors for about a year and a half. She says, oh, Sonny, she said, she's a nice girl, but don't marry a Catholic. They're full of bad surprises. I said, you're wrong, Grandma. So I married this girl, and <laughs> she wasn't wrong. The, uh, it wasn't she was a bad girl, just the opposite. She was a good girl. And they never tell Lutheran boys, if you marry a good Catholic girl, you're just about to have a big family, whether you plan on one or not. <laughs> and uh, I became a national distributor of small Catholics. <laughs> Certainly good for the old ambition to go to work, though. Household finance call again, I get better get a job. <laughs> and I went out in the world, I became a sports writer on newspapers. Then I got a job in advertising and better jobs and had some ups and downs. All these years I drank. And drinking helped me to do things that I never would have been able to do by myself, seems to me. Because of myself, I'm kind of an introverted, shy, feel inadequate person. But when I drink, it changes things. 
I become much different. I, uh, you know, it's hard to be a public ex public relations guy when you can't think of anything to say when you're sober. You know. Well, going to be a scorcher tomorrow. Huh? <laughs> I have a few drinks and I'm in the Algonquin Ranch. <laughs> I'm a better father, it seems to me. I'm a better everything. Husband, better neighbor, everything. I'm just a fun guy. Alcohol is the best friend I've ever had. If you're kind of new tonight, you may, uh, that may sound bad to hear that in a meeting, but it really is true. Uh, you know, to this day, I'm, I can't b understand these boobs who get up the podium and say, that damn alcohol was poisoned from the first drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like hearing somebody badmouth an old girlfriend of mine. Yeah. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. She may be a pig now, but she didn't used to be. Yeah. <laughs> Alcohol changed the way things looked to me. And in looking back, I can see what it did. I didn't know it at the time, but it always in retrospect, when you're sober, you could look back and see things. It took a person like me who never felt like I was enough, really. And for a few hours at least, I became more than enough. <laughs> to a person like me who had lived with fear intermittently all my life. And for a few hours, I become fearless. You want to fight a cop? Let me know. <laughs> want someone to jump from a balcony into a swimming pool? Shit. <laughs> you know, it takes a person like me who's always been subject to Re rejection, I can't stand it. And for a few hours, I become the rejecter instead of the rejectee. The best example of that, I must have said it a thousand times, but I don't know a better way to say it. I'm sure a lot of young guys, old guys too, in this room have sat in a bar late at night, had a few drinks, and watched a literal miracle take place in front of your eyes. <laughs> Watch some old beast gradually become beautiful. Closing time, I might sidle over to such an old queen and uh, <laughs> imply there will be delights beyond her comprehension. Should you like to join me in the old Chevy? <laughs> now, she would say, no. If I were sober, I guess I'd hang myself. I couldn't bear it. But when I've had a few drinks, I don't feel rejected. I feel sorry for her. <laughs> Too bad, bitch. Don't come begging tomorrow. That's why I drink. It just makes things a little better. Sometimes, unfortunately, I drink a little too much. Or in this age of victimization, I would like to say, apparently many times I was thoughtlessly overserved. Not my fault. <laughs> and I get drunk, and when I get drunk, sometimes I act bizarrely. I didn't know why until I found out in psychoanalysis. The Norwegian Lutheran Church had repressed me till I was like Prometheus chained to a rock. And alcohol broke my bonds, at least temporarily. And that seemed reasonable to me. I never could get a cop to buy the idea. You know, well, I'm removed. Get in the car, asshole. Get him. And so I was sent to my first AA meeting in 1949. That's a long time ago. Most of you little snots weren't even born, were you? <laughs> we love you. <laughs> we, I, sometimes I forget to say this, but I should say it tonight. You know, we, some, when I was new, I was 22 years old. Now, it doesn't seem young in AA now, but there wasn't at that time anybody within 20 years of it that they ever heard of. Is this, I saw someone come in five years old and said they were an alcoholic. And these guys just said, well, come, on, you, come on, what the hell are you doing here? I was sent here. And uh, I had no idea that uh, I, I thought it might be an alcoholic, but after I went to a few meetings, I realized there wasn't, and nothing after that ever changed my mind. I knew I was an alcoholic. I remember one time this guy, like my third meeting or so, this guy said to me, you, for Christ's sake, you think you're an alcoholic? I said, no, I don't. I don't. He said, what do you have that thinks wrong with you? I said, I think I'm too sensitive. 
Now, I'll give you a little moral to the story. He laughed at me just the way you laughed at me. Better remember this. When they say stupid things like, I am too sensitive, remember that may be the first time you're trying to be honest in years and years. Try not to laugh. They don't know you're laughing with them. They think you're laughing at them and that humiliation is back and they'll chink up again. But I didn't, all I, was, I didn't know the guy was laughing with me. I, he laughed at me and they laughed. And I never told anybody the truth again. I told them whether they wanted to hear it. I never told them the truth. So I went to A off and on. I went to psychoanalysis. And I read books. And I got some better jobs. And as the years went by, I got some successful and a failure. And then successes and a failure. And I didn't realize the pattern until I took my inventory years later. Succeed for a little while. Almost as though I couldn't let myself succeed because I felt dirty, not fail. And almost succeed and fail. And the day finally came in my life that cannot come to people in, with my background and education and ability. One morning, I found myself being physically thrown out of the Midnight Mission in Los Angeles, the Skid Row Mission. The guy said, and stay out of here, you bum. And I tried to explain to him, I'm not a bum. Three years ago, I was on the faculty of the University of Texas. Ads that I helped write, the old Elsie Nelmer ads for the Borden Company, were running at very weak in life and time and Collier's and Saturday Evening Post. I've had my picture in the New York Times for achievement. How many people do you know have had their picture in the New York Times for achievement? But it's hard to explain these things in midair. You know, you do, you know. <laughs> and unfortunately, about a month before that, a guy in the Phoenix jail had kicked my front teeth out. So I wasn't hitting those consonants quite as cleanly as I'd like. <laughs> but I stood outside of the Midnight Mission on the corner of 4th and Los Angeles Street, and my clothes were gone, and my career was gone, and my family was gone, my children were gone, my parents were gone, my front teeth were gone. You know, you can get new, you can get new families and jobs and careers, but like our book says, we are, we are like men who have lost their front teeth. We never grow new ones, or whatever it says. Um, if there's anyone new here tonight who's lost teeth and feels bad, let me give you some hope. Once you become spiritually wonderful, they grow back. <laughs> Have your sponsor explain that to you tomorrow night. <laughs> but it was raining that morning, so I didn't know what to do, so I walked 71 blocks in the rain out to the corner of Wilshire and Fairfax where there's a little AA club that I'd been asked to leave a week before for being in there drunk and fighting. And they didn't want to let me in, but I prevailed upon them to let me in. And I had... I don't recall ever feeling so bad because it was all gone. I, I couldn't believe it. It's just as though something had taken it all away. It took it over a period of time, but never seemed that way to me. And I, uh, I had no intention to stay sober. I didn't want to stay sober. Staying sober had no incentive to me at all, at all. The only time I'd ever stayed sober any length of time in my life, I stayed sober once in Texas. And the reason I was able to stay sober is because I'd taken a vow on my son's casket. I'd been in jail when he died, just overnight, but it was the wrong night. And I took my vow and I said, this will never happen again when we have... So I had two jobs. I was working days and another job at night to make up for a previous run. And these kids had moved down there and they're loud and they're noisy and I loved them, but they hot and noisy. And my wife was asking me what the hell's wrong with me. And I just, I needed a drink so bad I could not stand it. And one day they just went to church one Sunday morning and I parked the car in the garage, hooked up a hose, turned the motor and went to sleep and died. I couldn't think of anything else to do. And a neighbor was watching this and he came over and pulled me out and beat on my chest and breathed my mouth and rushed me to the hospital, oxygenated me for a couple of days, moved me to the psychiatric ward, examined me for three or four days and then committed me to the Texas State Insane Asylum at Big Spring, Texas for an indefinite period as a uh, Paranoid schizophrenic. Now I'll tell you folks, that's how I get when I stay sober. <laughs> that, uh, I wouldn't call that your basic drinking problem. <laughs> and they were mean to me in Texas. And they all sounded like Joni. Move to the electric shock ward and have these electrodes say, we gonna hip you boy. <laughs> Why don't you go hip somebody else, you big redneck some bitch, you know. I've often thought about that. I'd like to go back and find that psychiatrist. 
He must be about 90 now. I, uh, I bet I could move him around pretty good. <laughs> you quack! You call yourself a psychiatrist? You examine me and call me a dual personality, a schizophrenic personality? You ought to lose your license. If I could have got my personalities down to two, I'd have made it, for Christ's sake. <laughs> my problem has always been this committee that forms at the drop of a hat in our head. What do you think we ought to do? Let's get out of here. Don't think we could. What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, uh... I hear people in AA say, I'm not sure the program is enough for me. I may need group therapy. <laughs> not me. I just go for a ride alone in my car. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 That's what's good about alcohol. It reduces it to one voice. It may be a bad voice, but it's one voice. Why don't you quit your job and punch the son of a bitch in the face? Okay. I have no ambition to stay sober no matter how bad it gets because my problem is not alcohol. And I'll tell you what. I, every long-term slipper that stays sober eventually, I'm sure, looks back and I say, what was different this time? What was different that day in 1958 that made it different from the day in 57 or 56 or 55? How can you, you long-term slipper, be sober 35 years? What happened there to change it? And I don't really see anything dramatic to change it. You don't know change it, it's a strange thing. I apparently got desperate enough without being aware of it and I don't think there's anything that helps a new person more than acute desperation. But I became desperate enough, and to be able to hang around that club, it seemed to me full of AA fanatics and old timers of three and four years who were just fanatics. And, they've, and in order, I did the same thing with those people that I did with the people in that damn ship. I didn't want what they had, and I didn't want to do what they did, but I needed to be left to, to hang around there. So I'd take embarrassing stuff stupid second-rate actions that I thought were demeaning I never would have done if I'd had an opportunity to change it. And I, I remember thinking what a sad thing this was, because I was living in the back seat of an abandoned car back at the club, and I, uh, the one thing I'd always had, sounds a little egotistical, but it really wasn't, I always had this, I have my intellectual integrity. Bad things have happened to me, but I've never sold out. I've never become a phony. If you want to know what I feel about something, I'll tell you. You don't have to worry whether I mean it. I mean it. I just tell you what I feel, and I tell you, what, if I don't believe in something, I say, screw it, and I won't do it. On and on. And I start doing these things that were inane and stupid, and just so they wouldn't throw me out. And I remember lying awake and thinking, now I've done it. I'm now down and out, and I've sold up my intellectual integrity, too. I no longer have intellectual integrity. I'm just a phony like all the rest of these people, only I'm not the same type of person. Now, look back on those days of phoniness and lack of intellectual integrity and being a wussy and letting people get me to do things that I just hated. And I had no idea then, but I do now. That is when my recovery started. That is when I started to get better. I had no idea then or thereafter that the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous are the things that make you get better. Not your emotives, not your intellectual integrity, not your education, not your insights, not your psychiatric evaluations. The damn old silly, demeaning, inane actions of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it says this throughout our literature. And a little by little, begin to stay sober. And I got a sponsor. They said, get a sponsor. And I saw this actor. I used to see him in movies. He played character roles, a loving uncle. I thought, he'll, he'll be nice. And uh, turned out he wasn't nice. He was, should have won the Academy Award for every nice role he ever played, the old bastard. <laughs> and he was just mean to me. And I, he'd say things like, I said, I'm not eating hardly anything. I'm getting hand up. What am I going to do? He said, get a job. I said, Jesus, Bob, look how terrible I look. He says, get a terrible job. <laughs> that is not the love I seek. <laughs> but I tried to dodge him as much as possible. He would catch me, and he'd demean me and make me do things. Thank speakers. 
apologize to people. You know, just go and apologize to that woman. Why should I? Because I heard you call her a bitch. <laughs> well, she is a bitch, Bob. <laughs> Why do you think she's a bitch? She told her new girl to stay away from me. <laughs> well, she's right. Apologize. And what sold me out was this. I'd be so intimidated, I'd apologize. Sorry. <laughs> you bitch. <laughs> and I had no idea, because it seems to me, really, realistically speaking, if you're kind of new or wondering where all this is about or going through a bad time, it's hard to remember that that's what AA is about. Altering actions regardless of your perception. An example, the best example I know is like that curtain. We'll say that's a blue curtain. I assume it's blue. Or if all of you in this room told me that curtain was red, that wouldn't change my opinion that much. I think you're either crazy or you got, you're some kind of a joke or there's something wrong. I know that's blue. Now, what AA makes AA difficult, sponsors come by. Now, they don't actually do this, but it's like this. They say things like, that curtain's red. It is not red. It is blue. <laughs> I said it's red. It's blue. But God damn it, you act like it's red. <laughs> yeah. Now, they don't tell you the colors of curtains. That's too easy. They tell you other things. Apologize, that woman. <laughs> Shut up. Don't quit that job till you get a better job. But they're using me. <laughs> Nobody cares. Go to work, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Don't leave that meeting. But they never call on me. They, they, hate, they treat me like a bunch of crap, Bob. It's because you're a bunch of crap. Go to the goddamn meeting. And you let some old jerk intimidate you, and you take these stupid actions, and one day you turn around, and the curtain is red. <laughs> But you, uh... And then you have to spend the rest of your natural life dealing with dumbbells that think it was blue, you know. <laughs> but little bit, I, little I stayed sober. Had a terrible job, got fired as a dishwasher, got fired as a furniture mover, got tired as... All such stuff. But I stayed sober. And little by little, it, uh, I stayed sober. And, Time I was a year sober, I'd worked up to being a wrapping package in an advertising agency. Same kind of jab I'd had when I was 14. Kind of the AA rocket to stardom. <laughs> and when I was two years sober, I got a little job finding as a writer in a medical corporation. They didn't have any front teeth still. And I said to my sponsor, I, got, I put some money aside, and I'm going to get some front teeth. <laughs> he said, send that money to your kids in Texas. I said, Jesus, Bob, they got front teeth. <laughs> One woman didn't have front teeth. He says, you're a crappy father. Send him the goddamn money. So send him the money. So I went to this work, went to this job, carrying my lip like this. A lot of people never knew I didn't have front teeth. I just thought I'd been burned in a fire. <laughs> but I went to work every day, and by the time I was five years sober, I was director of advertising at a medical corporation. I had, had teeth then. When I was seven, when I was, uh, seven years sober, I was... Now, the guy that were brought in Hollywood, we created something called Boss Radio, became the number one hard rock station in the world. We all wore shiny suits and said things like, what's coming on down, baby? <laughs> when I was 10 years sober, I was a downtown doing public relations with the oil companies. 15 years sober, I was a marketing director for a publishing firm in Beverly Hills. When I was five years sober, the same wife and all those children heard the crinkle of green in my wallet all the way to a post office box in Dallas leaped out of their post office box, fled to my side. Nine months and 10 seconds later, another Catholic hit the street. <clears throat> Where are you when I need you, Leona Bobbitt? Yeah. I want you to know something. Much of the things I'm telling you tonight, I've said many times. That last statement is the first time I ever said that or thought of it. And I'm never going to say it again. I'm ashamed of myself. <laughs> but they've all grown up now. They're all gone away and everything is fine. And uh, isn't that nice? If you're going to nude tonight, 
because it should give you some warmth, because uh, I've got it all together, and you haven't. <laughs> And all of these things are true, but I just want to take about five or six minutes now to talk about the most important, all of this is an introduction to something else. <laughs> Short subject, but just an introduction. The most important thing I've said tonight, I said a long time ago, and none of you paid any attention to, nor should you. I said, my name is Clancy Immisland, and I'm an alcoholic. Now, when the hell did I become an alcoholic? I was an alcoholic when I drank. I was an alcoholic the day I got sober, and I didn't become an alcoholic since then. When did I ever become an alcoholic? I'll tell you when I became an alcoholic. When I fell into the hands of fanatics and activists who made me take actions to enable me to survive long enough to finally discover what was wrong with me. Because the one argument I always had, but my problem really isn't alcohol. And in looking back, I can see how I felt that so intensely. I couldn't, couldn't put my finger on it, couldn't speak it but maybe some in this room has this feeling tonight. I look like an alcoholic, and sometimes I drink like an alcoholic, but I'm not really an alcoholic. I've gone to many, many AA meetings, and I'll tell you what alcoholics are. They are people who, when they drink, their emotions get screwed up, and their lives get screwed up, and AA sobers them up, and their lives get straightened out, and their emotions get straightened out, and they feel better from then on. And I look the same, and I sound the same many times but I am just exactly the opposite. I, when I don't drink, my emotions get screwed up and my life gets screwed up. I drink to feel the way they feel when they're sober. I drink to straighten out my emotions and to straighten out my life. And sometimes I drink too much. And then well-meaning people say, oh, your problem is alcohol, son. You go to AA and you'll be all right. And in my, I don't, know, I don't know how to answer it, but down deep inside of me, every visceral emotion is, but you don't understand. There's something different about me. But if you go to A and say, my case is different, they laugh at you, so you don't say it there. But you know it is, and God damn it, you can, there's no way around it. How can my problem be alcohol? How can I be an alcoholic my problem is an alcohol? I'm glad that I survived long enough to discover the most important single fact I have ever learned. If my problem is alcohol, I am not an alcoholic. And conversely, if I'm an alcoholic, my problem is not alcohol. Now, if you're new, that may sound strange and upside down. It's like some inner child guru telling you new breakthrough. <laughs> but that's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm convinced. The message of this book, the message of these meetings. I'm sure I'm one of the few people in this room who sat and talked to Bill Wilson about it at length. That's what he felt, circa 1963 in his office. And, uh, but you say, of course the problem is alcohol. It's got to be. I can disprove that in 10 seconds. If the problem is alcohol, detoxes turn on recovered people. And they don't. Hospitals turn on recovered people. Jails turn on recovered people. They turn out people, if they'd be like me and I presume like you, who are sober with varying amounts of information what would be wrong with them. But I'll guarantee you, unless something dramatic happens after that, sooner or later they must always eventually drink or sedate. Well, if the problem is an alcohol, what is it? It is something that sounds like alcohol, and a lot of people think it's the same thing, and it kills them. But it isn't the same thing. The problem is something called alcoholism. You say, well, alcohol, alcoholism, same thing. Not the same thing. I'll guarantee you, if you be a person of my type, the day will come when your sanity and life will depend on remembering the difference. What are the differences? Well, it's a little late. Let's just put it in one sentence. An alcohol problem is overcome by stopping drinking and cleaning up your act. In this strange, denigrating, destroying, mind-consuming, eventually fatal thing called alcoholism, you will discover sooner or later, if you haven't discovered it yet, that stopping drinking and cleaning up your act has no significant long-term effect on your life other than to gradually make it so painful you can't stand it. How painful? Just so painful you can't stand it. More, the fatal part of alcoholism is sobriety. If stopping drinking was the answer, there'd be no problem. It gets so painful that it gets much worse than the remembered pain of drinking, because the pain of drinking has, brings relief with it. But even that doesn't make you alcoholic. That just prepares you to be. 
you must be one of the six or seven percent of people in the world and it always has been as far as research indicates who get an unnatural reaction to alcohol but as I said earlier nobody knows it's an unnatural reaction it's the only reaction you know what is this, the unnatural reaction you know what it is he doesn't have to stay drunk all the time or you get crazy we hear a lot of AA talks where they're all that crazy because they're interesting but I see people die who have never acted crazy once they get more and more catatonic the, the unnatural reaction for alcohol in an alcoholic is this it must have the power to almost instantly make everything all right that's all just make everything all right it doesn't do that for 93 percent of the people who drink alcohol that's why they don't drink it's not because they're morally superior it doesn't change their perception of reality and everyone in this room who's an alcoholic knows that feeling of gazing into a gray tunnel called life and at least temporarily putting a little technicolor down there somewhere and feeling a little bit differently and hearing that drink and go man feel out your fingernails when you put on the wagon and that uh, that phenomenon is called alcoholism and you want to know something strange it is the most deniable disease in the world over the years I've had three or four people that I sponsor die of cancer at UCLA hospital and they have kind of a hospice end of the cancer ward some people get better of course you get operating they're fine but some die and there's a hospital end where they send them to die and I I go up there with these guys and I just hate it I hate that place but that's what sponsors are supposed to do I guess sit up there and try to be pleasant but I remember looking around a few years ago looking around all these people dying and thinking what would these people say if I said hey got a deal for you would you take an hour or two a day and go someplace with me meet some people drink some coffee listen to people talk get get some new friends and you know just become part of something would you do that if I could cure your cancer man they would give you their homes and their cars and anything they got take me maybe the worst place I've ever been in my life is the Los Angeles County Charity Ward on AIDS it isn't that the ward itself is bad but what it connotes is bad people dying in there we heard our Aladon speaker discuss it last night it's a sad terrible disease and these men are dying and there's no way they're going to get out of there nearly all of them some have open sores it's just frightful and not in this charity ward not only are they sick but they've been thrown away by life by fate by their families I remember standing there thinking what do these guys say that hey got a deal for you guys would you take a series of actions that you thought were stupid maybe uh, just doing agreeing to do whatever I said maybe writing down some things that you've been hiding as a secret maybe telling them to somebody and going back to people that you've hurt that you, you know and tell them that you're sorry and making amends to them and try to change up your life would you do all that if I told you to if I could cure your AIDS they would crawl across the floor and lick your feet but you go to that same hospital of the alcoholic ward downstairs where men are lying in bed with their livers out to here and their skin is yellow and their eyeballs are yellow. So come on we're gonna have an AA meeting I'm not going to any goddamn AA meeting I'm not an alcoholic and it's funny except when he came back next month he's dead and there's a new guy in the bed dying saying he's not an alcoholic now if a guy can four days away from death prove he's not an alcoholic you and I sure as hell can just by looking in the mirror and that's why such a sinister thing as this is we can always prove that alcohol is not really the problem and what we got to remember that it really isn't alcoholism isn't the problem and the worst part of alcoholism is sobriety and being sober is not the goal of AA being sober is not what we're in AA for being sober is the entrance to AA and after you are sober and after you are here and the pain begins as it must because the natural state of sober alcoholism is mounting anxiety and depression whereas our book says restlessness and discontent then you must do something you know what you must do the hardest thing you and I will ever have to do we must start to surrender and what do you have to surrender you must surrender your perception of what you think is right for you and it just goes against every fiber of the being it goes against every fiber of the being and that's why most people who have alcoholism continue to die for it 95 percent and they die I'm sure saying the same thing but you don't understand I'm not an alcoholic my problems came when I was sober I just drank to get a little relief for Christ's sake and got a little out of hand and they don't realize they just defined the disease of alcoholism 
And that's why you and I must remember. One of the main reasons I still go to meetings is to remember things I learned 35 years ago and I've learned every week since because my emotions will shut them out eventually. To remember the purpose of AA is to enable me to little by little continue to surrender my will and my life to the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, the only thing that has ever worked for people like you and me. Now you hear these old timers sometimes, they make it sound so easy. They say, I came to this program and I threw in the towel. And it's just been wonderful ever since. <laughs> That's podium crap. No human being ever did that. What you do is this. You come to this program and you throw in the towel. And as soon as the heat's off a little, you grab that baby back. <laughs> and then you spend the rest of your natural life tearing off small strips and see if that'll satisfy him. <laughs> you know. AA is an amazing place because you little by little you surrender. That's what that surrender is. And they, if you allow it, sponsors can take the same pain that ensures you much get drunk and if you let them they can change the pain to make you take actions that you never would on your own in a hundred years we were talking about that this afternoon around the world america certainly around the world i've been most places in aa there are places called pockets of enthusiasm where you have really lively a and exciting and good meetings then you go through 100 miles of gray meetings and people who hate to be there. Then there's another pocket of enthusiasm. And uh, it's all over the world. Every time you come to a pocket of enthusiasm, you will find a place with a strong sponsorship ethic. And the reason for that is, when you have a strong sponsorship ethic, you will be forced to take actions that you would never take on your own, in your own judgment. And that's why wherever there's strong sponsorship, there is strong AA. Because people are involved and they're starting to maintain enthusiasm. Yeah, it's an interesting word, enthusiasm, in passing. It's from an old Greek root, and within, theos, God. Enthusiasm means the expression of the God within. And that's really what it is. And nobody can maintain it all the time, but I know when you stay active, you can, I, I, the greatest gift I have is I maintain enthusiasm most of the time, more than anything I've ever been able to do. And that's why we gather together to share our experience, strength, and hope here to remember to surrender, to remember to do the things that Dr. Bob's did, to help the people behind us. No single thing in AA is more important than working with others. All the other things are valuable, but there's no important thing because that's the only identification they have. Alcoholics Anonymous is not the book Alcoholics Anonymous. It is not this meeting, it is not this convention, it is not love, it is not service. All these things are sidelights and very important ones to AA. But what Alcoholics Anonymous is, is the same thing tonight in May 21st, 1994, as it was June 10th, 1935. One alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to help him reduce his feelings of difference at least enough so that he will begin to take actions he does not yet believe in. All of our life, we've heard people say to us, I know how you feel. Your doctor says it. Your minister says it. Your mother says it. But you know they don't. Here, if you stay here and do these things, one day you'll have the greatest thing you'll ever hear. Some old boob will say, I know how you feel. You'll say, for Christ's sake, he does know how I feel. And the, your recovery is on the way. So that's why it's kind of important to remember all these things. I'm glad to be sober. It's kind of important you stop and think, we are here tonight because... When AA was being founded in Delaware, some guy in North Carolina wrote a letter, said, you know, we're going to be extinct if we don't start doing something about it, and brought about the traditions and the foundation of our fellowship, and put it into a way that we can all live and, and survive. The last thing I want to say is that, uh, as some of you know, when I was about 15 years sober in some hideous fit of spiritual misjudgment, I left a job in Beverly Hills, and for the last 20 years, I run the Midnight Mission on Skid Row in Los Angeles. There's a man I threw out 12 years ago. <laughs> Wish I'd have thrown him out sooner than that, when I think about it. <laughs> and then people say, isn't that wonderful? He runs this Skid Row mission. Isn't he wonderful? No, it isn't wonderful. 
I get on the Santa Monica freeway in the morning, I go downtown, my car wants to get off at Robertson in Beverly Hills, I gotta fight the wheel. I want to let you go to that office where the pretty blonde in the tight sweater brought my coffee. He said, here, Mr. Emerson, anything else you'd like? <laughs> no. But I'll go to, when I go back to work uh, next Wednesday morning in Los Angeles, when I get back to Los Angeles, I won't, I'll go to, I'll see who died over the weekend, who smashed their head in convulsions on the sidewalk, who took some too much cheap cocaine crack, died in front of us. I'll see all this agony and I'll think, Jesus, I uh, can't stand it, but I can't. You say, why would you do that? Because the funny thing, when I get on the Santa Monica freeway at night going home, I always feel more complete than I ever did going down under those elevators popping my fingers. It's almost as though what I've been made to do. If you're new tonight, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Even if you go to meetings, even if you work the steps, even if you get a sponsor, we can't guarantee you that you can have your own mission in 15 years, you know. <laughs> There's only so many to go around. I got mine and... <laughs> but we can guarantee you that you can walk with dignity and a degree of spiritual peace more than people like you and I have. Because what does AA do? I'm sure there are new guys here who say, this guy's been dry 35 years. He's about to burst into flame, for Christ's sake. <laughs> I'll tell you why I stay active and what AA does for me after 35 years. It does very slowly for me what alcohol used to do fast. I don't know a better way to put it. It takes a person like me who never was enough, and most of the time today I feel like I'm enough. Sometimes I don't. That used to bother me until I realized no human being feels like they're enough all the time. That's all right. It takes a person like me who has been afraid most of my life, and uh, I'm fearless most of the time. I find myself, some of you know, I walk down alleys in Skid Row today where the police are afraid to go down with drawn guns. And I'm down there with my smile and my chatter to pull some poor bastard out of there. But I'm still a human being. When I sit home at night with my wife and we hear a suspicious noise in the backyard, I send her to see what it is. <laughs> it may be a boogeyman, and everyone knows that Boogeymen are more afraid of al than they ain't. <laughs> no boogeyman can stand up with that cold smile coming out of the darkness. <laughs> it takes a person like me who uh, has always felt rejected and have my hurt feelings. And I don't feel that way most of the time. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I get my feelings hurt so bad today, I could almost cry, but except I know it's a transitory thing. Because that's part of being a human being. And that's what it's about. And that's why you and I must do the things that they talk about. Remember, nobody ever put it better than Dr. Bob. It's love and service. We've got to help the person behind us. We've got to remember that erring member of the tongue, that God will allow us to survive as long as we do these things. That we must maintain the integrity of the 12 traditions so that people long after us can find the same truth here that each of us have found and are so grateful for. I'm very glad to be here tonight. I'm glad to be safe and sane and sober. I hope if I forget this path, you'll remind me. If I see you forget this path, I'll remind you. Together we can do it. Thank you.